So today, as we come into this, I want to um, just bring before you the phrase, can't see the forest for the trees, okay? Can't see the forest for the trees. We've all heard that. It refers to our tendency to focus on, on details to such an extent that we overlook the big picture. It could be somebody on a production line producing components for a car and uh, they, they may find the most efficient way and the cheapest material but they forget that in the big picture that component has to have 100% reliability because people's lives may depend on it. And so if they're just worried about making that component as cheaply as possible and selling as many of them as they can, it may end up costing people their lives. They can't see the forest for the trees. But it, it may look a little like this. Okay. We, we see the, the trees. We can imagine ourselves walking through the wood and we look up and we, to the sky. And in that moment, we can look and we can see maybe 50 trees in this particular picture, and we, we stand there and we appreciate the beauty. And we can admire their height. We can wonder about their age and their endurance and, and what they've seen and experienced over the years. And there's a lot to admire and consider about this picture. We could sit on that particular spot and and commune with God and, and think about the grandeur of the universe from that location. As picturesque as this photograph is, it wouldn't help us find our way out of the forest. There's a lot of questions about where we are at that moment that can't be answered by looking in that direction. Okay? From that location, we can't tell where we are. We can't tell how big the forest is, how far away civilization might be. The only way to admire the forest, the only way to understand the place that this location has in the whole you know, environment is to step back far enough to see the whole thing. And so this next picture isn't a whole forest, but we can see the edges of the forest, can't we? We, we can get a sense of orientation, that, that there's a, a pond that leads up to the forest, that there's mountains on the other side of the forest. And we could, we could go back and we could look up at the sky and look up the branches, and, and if we were thirsty, we would never know where we could go to get fresh water. If we wanted to get out of the forest, we, might, we wouldn't be able to see where the mountains are. But when we're, we're able to take that step back, we get a sense of there's mountains here. There's water, fresh water here. There's trees, there's forest over there. And so we can appreciate the beauty of the forest and the features of the landscape without focusing on a particular tree. Particular trees can be beautiful, can't they? We're, we're coming into fall. And we appreciate the beauty of those leaves. And there'll be somebody that has a tree in their front yard, and we see that single tree, and we say, isn't that tree beautiful? But sometimes we look at the forest, and it's the collective that's beautiful. And we don't need to focus on one particular tree. But if we start taking away those particular trees, ultimately there's no forest that's left. And so neither one of these photographs can claim to be more beautiful than the other. Each of them are distinct. And we probably have one that we like more than the other. Right? 
Some of us like that view up through the leaves into the sky. Other, others of us want to see the reflection and get a sense for the countryside as a whole. But really, we need both of them to get a complete picture. Sometimes our Bible study can look a little like these pictures. We have a favorite verse, a favorite topic and that we focus on and that we talk about. And when Bible class comes around to that passage, everybody knows that you're going to tell us what you think about that. That person in the Bible or that verse or, or, or like we've heard it before, but you're going to tell us again because that's your wheelhouse. Okay? And that's all right. We love you for that. Okay? But we all have those things, don't we? Other times, though, we know the, the story, and I, I, I think those of us that have grown up in churches, we tend to have spent so much time in Bible classes that we, we know a lot of the verses, right? We're the, we're the ones looking up through the, through the leaves, seeing the trees. But I think a lot of younger people, people that haven't uh, gone through Bible classes and sat in a lot of lessons like that, they tend to have more of a sense of the big picture. And they say, well, you know, there was creation, there was Jesus, now there's me. Right? That's a real big picture, isn't there? <laughs> right? And, and so we sort of narrow it down a little bit over time, but there's, there's value to that. Because they're, they're saying there was God, there is God, there was Jesus come to earth, and now there's me. And, and that is sort of a gospel message, isn't it? And, and somehow it skipped over the book of, Jeremiah, that skipped over the, the Gospels even, the letters of Paul, but it, it still contains this movement of God through time, through the world. It's incomplete, but when we get bogged down and we're, we're looking at the, the Greek word and we're saying, is this the church or a church or John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And some people say, no, that was a word. And we, we get in, and it's a significant conversation. But if that's what we think about when we think about Jesus, then we've lost the big picture, haven't we? We might be really good on that particular detail and know all the Greek syntaxes, but if we've lost the, the big picture, we've lost the picture. We need both of these perspectives in our lives. When I last preached in this series, we talked about the importance of the Church of Christ to fellowship or commune with Christ. Right? If we're the church belonging to Christ, then it's natural for us to fellowship with Christ, to commune with Christ around the Lord's table. And this week we're, we're building on that topic. When we come around the Lord's table, we celebrate Jesus. We have fellowship with Jesus, who was dead and is no longer dead. Right? That's why we do it, isn't it? We, we wouldn't do it if Jesus was still dead. Although we talk about, we remember his death and his, his burial and we, we remember his life and his suffering and his blood and his body broken, even though that's, we do all of that and we talk about all of that, we wouldn't do it if that was all there was. We remember that Jesus died for us. But that's not the whole story. We remember that he rose. He was dead. He is no longer dead. He's not just alive again. He's alive eternally. Alive eternally. And so Jesus invites everyone to his table. Sometimes, though, if we're maybe if we're kind of new to, to church, um, oops, I missed those slides. It feels like the Lord's table can be a little bit like Cinco de Mayo. Let me explain what I mean by this. Anybody enjoy celebrating Cinco de Mayo? Nobody? Nope. Tacos, anyone? Burritos? 
uh, corn chips and salsa. Uh, there's lots of good things about Cinco de Mayo. Okay. And, um, okay, you guys are pagans. I, I mean, <coughs> maybe I, I spent a little bit of time in the South. It didn't take me that long to, to catch on to this. But, <coughs> okay, so the thing is with Cinco de Mayo, is we, Americans celebrate it. Can we go with that? You've seen on television. There are people that celebrate Cinco de Mayo. And uh, they seem to be happy as they do it. Okay? And you could tell from looking at them that they weren't born in Mexico. And, and so people celebrate the day, but the holiday doesn't really mean anything to them. They just like Mexican food. Maybe like Mexican music. Maybe they just like going out with friends. In fact, the chances are that most of us don't know the significance of the day or the names of the people involved in the historical event that, that is celebrated on that day. And so we can, in a similar vein, celebrate the Lord's Supper and still be detached from the Lord. Okay? Like, like Jesus invites everyone to the table. And everybody can participate in it. There's no quiz as you come in the door. Right? But, but there are times that, that we could come in and we say, well, I'm doing this. Everybody else is doing it, but I'm not really sure what's going on. And maybe even when we've been a Christian for a long time, we kind of find ourselves going through the motions, right? Take a, a little bite of this, a little sip of that, and on to the next thing. Jesus, though, gives us a way to not just share and experience each Sunday, and remember that something happened a long time ago. That's what Cinco de Mayo is for most of us, right? We come together around a table, we celebrate, we enjoy each other's presence, we fellowship, and we remember that something happened a long time ago. And, and, and so Jesus, though, gives us something more than that. He gives his followers a way to actually connect with him. And that's where we're going to go today. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 explains to us that our baptism is an act of identifying with Jesus. We join ourselves not just to his cause, not just to his entourage, not just to his teaching, but we join ourselves to his death and by extension to his resurrection. It's not just something that we remember and therefore we celebrate it all these years later. It's something that we ourselves are joined to. Now, I think that baptism can be one of those topics where to some degree we look at the trees and we can miss the forest. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 clearly makes the connection between repentance, baptism, forgiveness of our sins, and receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay. And because it's so clear to us, and because we maybe have heard so many lessons on this or finish in this with, with quoting this verse, we can overlook other functions that baptism fulfills. Now, as a minister, I know that sometimes we'll get together with other church leaders and we'll ask things like, how's your church going? And we'll talk about the attendance and we'll talk about, are we making budget? We'll talk about how many people have been baptized. And so sometimes we, we talk about baptisms as a measure of church growth, of, of church health over a period of time. We need to recognize that baptism, though, isn't the best, or the number of baptisms, isn't the best measure of church congregational health. It's a measure, it's a, or an indicator, if you will, but it's not the only or the, necessarily the best. We need to recognize that baptism is only the beginning 
of a church's involvement in a person's life. It only signifies the beginning of a person's life walk with God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 asks the question about whether Christians can keep on sinning since Jesus is going to forgive us. Okay? In fact, we'd be doing Jesus a favor, wouldn't we? Because the more we sin, the more grace he gets to show, right? And the more grace Jesus gets to show, the more people will love him. That's a good part of Jesus' life, right? So my sinning is actually good for Jesus. So Paul answers by saying, you know, that's a ridiculous question. But the reason it's a ridiculous question is not because, I mean, on the face of it, it's like, how can more sinning be good? That seems to go against everything that we believe in, that we we understand. But he is more specific than this. He says, it's a ridiculous question because we've been baptized. How does baptism make that question more ridiculous than it already is? You see, we were buried with Christ. In baptism, we're joined to Jesus. We now have a new identity. An identity that doesn't want anything to do with sin. Verse 5 says, For if we have been united with him in his death, In in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. How are we united with Jesus' death? Okay, You see, we read it and we go, oh, that's good. But how does that happen? How are we united with his death? It happens in baptism. How are we united with his resurrection to eternal life? And the answer is the same in baptism. And so we see here two things that occur in baptism. The first is that we receive a new identity. We are now in Christ. You see, what we can miss when we want to focus on you need to have your sins forgiven is that somebody walks out and says, my sins are forgiven. I, I, my record is clean. I get to start over. I'm good with God. But they haven't changed. And so what Jesus is saying, no, when we're baptized and the forgiveness takes place and our sins are washed away, but he says, now we have this new identity. We are now in Christ. The second implication of that is we live a new way unlike verse one we can't now celebrate our sins we we can't recklessly continue to sin because as people who are in christ sin isn't compatible with that identity it's not because we'll get in trouble it's because it's not compatible with who we now are Now, we're real good at finding the loopholes in that, right? Because I don't know about you, but I know I certainly keep on sinning. But we understand the the shortcoming, the problem with that. It's not who we want to be. It's not who we should be. If we go back to chapter 5, we'll find in, in Romans here, we'll find one other function of baptism. Joining ourselves to Jesus gives us a new hope for an eternal future as we are spared from God's punishment. Since we have now been justified, made pure, made clean by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Okay, So it says something about our future. It's not just about our past. It's not just what Jesus did the thousands of years ago. It's not just what I did before my baptism. It's not even that I was baptized. I've now got a new identity. I live in a new way. 
and I move forward into a new future. You see? And all of that happens because I've joined myself with Christ in his death, in his resurrection, and in his baptism. I want to leave you today with a verse from Galatians. This verse does a great job of, I think, wrapping all of this up. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, we read this. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Right? There's, the, there's the sacrifice part, right? But Christ lives in me. There's the fellowship, right? We have the sacrifice, now we have the fellowship. We have this new identity because I no longer live. It's Christ living in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Notice the change that's taken place there. The life that I now live in the body, in the flesh, in this world, it's different. I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, talking about baptism isn't just a, an argument about which church does it right. It isn't just a, a debate about what the form of baptism is the correct one. Some of those topics can become the, the trees. And a forest needs trees, right? Or else it's not a forest. But we need to look beyond that also. Because it's not academic or a legal lecture. It's not a topic to be analyzed and dissected. In baptism, we are crucified with Christ. We're making a life change. We are dying to ourselves, to who we have been to this point in our life. We're taking on a new identity. Christ now lives in me. We were told before that we're in Christ. Now Christ lives in me also. Like a tune that we find ourselves humming all day. You know those. Can't get them out of your head. Even when you want to. Christ now lives in us. This in turn changes our behavior. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. And I think at this point we now come to the crux of the whole conversation. The driving force of this discussion. What drives me living in Christ and Christ living in me? What is it that drives me being united with Christ's death and his resurrection? It is that Jesus loved and still loves me and gave himself for me. If Jesus didn't love me, he wouldn't have given himself for me. If Jesus didn't give himself for me, how would I be united with him? Because we're united with him in his death. And because of that, we can be united with him in his resurrection. And so, understanding this is the, the point of origin. You see, baptism isn't our final goal. It's a tool it's a means to a goal. It's a God-given step to, or, or path to walk through. And it's a means to this great goal of fellowship, of relationship, of experiencing Christ's love, of, of being connected with Christ, of being in Christ, and of Christ being in us. That if we're not careful, it can be a tree and cause us to miss the forest. You see, I think sometimes I've heard it, baptism referred to as the first act of obedience. And I know that if you love me, you'll, you'll keep my commands. But when we say baptism is the first act of obedience, I think we miss that baptism is the joining of me and Jesus. Baptism is us becoming one. Baptism is my identity changing. We sometimes refer to it as being born again. Jesus would tell Nicodemus, be born 
of, the, of water and of the Spirit. And so we, if, if we narrow it down and say, oh, that's, a, that's an obedience thing. Or if we narrow it down and say, that's a proclamation thing, that's a public witness thing. Those things may be true, but it undersells what happens. That I die. And I come to life again. Living with Christ. And so there's a very real connection between using the name Church of Christ and emphasizing baptism as a means of uniting ourselves to Christ. Both of them announce the love that exists between us and God. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I need to be reminded of that. Sometimes I need to be reminded that I've been crucified with Christ. I need to be reminded that it's no longer me that's living. It's Christ who's living in me. I need to be reminded that although I'm still here and I'm living in the body and I'm messing up and I'm making mistakes, that I'm living by faith in the Son of God. I'm depending upon Him for my accomplishments, whatever they may be in this life. And I need to be reminded that he is the one, that Jesus is the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And it's only when I understand that last part that everything else makes sense. And we need to see the forest before we can focus on the trees. I want to offer you today that if you've never made a decision to join yourself with Jesus, to, to take his life into your life and, and to transform who you are, to create, to, to give yourself, or not to give yourself, to allow God to give you a better future. Then you have that opportunity today. Uh, you can talk to me, you can talk to uh, anyone here that you, you see up front this morning, you, anyone that you trust and feel safe with. We want to have that conversation with you. We want to explain what it's like to have Jesus in our lives. What it is for us to be in Christ and the difference that that can make. And we want to explain to you how you can do that and how baptism is, is part of that, uh, that process of knowing God and becoming one with Christ. We're going to sing a song. If you would like to respond during that song you can come to the front and let me know but you can more than welcome to talk to us afterwards as well and uh, anytime that's what we're here for because we worship God who loves us and gave himself for us